Hi everyone, my name is Allison Thompson and I'm with The Money Farm. I come from a grain farm in Monoma, Minnesota. My dad and my husband farm together. So far, so good, I might add. <laughs> um, but uh, I've been with The Money Farm since 2017 and actually I'm in the process of owning the business myself, so that'll be coming along here shortly. But I'm very excited to be taking over the legacy that Mike Kruger started with The Money Farm. He still helps me out time to time and a good, good analyst and a really good mentor. So very excited for the next chapter of the money farm. So if you have questions later, feel free to give me um, give me questions. Otherwise, feel free to interrupt me as I go too. I'm sure when they saw my slide presentation and saw all these slides, they're like, "Holy crap! How is she going to cover this in 20 minutes?" Little did they know, I talk really fast. <laughs> so uh, I have to remember to slow down. But of course, everybody this year, obviously, markets are still going to the moon, right? And uh, fortunately, we got a really good bump going into the new year too. Uh, low volume. Thin traders can really do some funky things with the market. This year it happened in our favor. Um, and I looked at markets this morning, I thought, oh man, the markets are not giving me a good week to go on the road. <laughs> but they actually are turning around. So we haven't closed yet, but it looks like they're still hanging in there pretty good. So what I'm gonna talk about today is this new era that we're kind of seeing spill over from year to year. Um, this year going into 23, we have a lot of continuing things from 2022. So I'm gonna go over those briefly. Go through an outlook. Of course, we have a USDA report this week as well on Thursday, so we'll have some new numbers then. And then, of course, some drivers into 23 as well. So, and then, of course, I'm good for an analysis and recommendations too. So what happened in 2022? Well, plenty. I'm gonna start with the economy first of all. Obviously, inflation isn't going anywhere. We peaked in June, everyone knows that, at 9.1%. And the Fed would like it to get down to 2%. Well, given November's inflation rate at 7.1, we got a ways to go. So uh, I think it's something that we're gonna be hearing for a while. Unfortunately, it does look like we're gonna be um, dealing with this for a while. Uh, we will get December's inflation rates out this week as well. So actually we got a lot of information the week I'm on the road, <laughs> but it'll be exciting anyway. So in interest rates, they've been aggressively increased since March. They've put them up seven times so far. Um, it looks like they're meeting again the beginning of February, and I think we're gonna see another rate increase, unfortunately. But um, there is a lot of talk that it might be less. We might see 25 basis points instead of 50 this time. Um, but I have a feeling they might keep doing that a couple more times yet before hopefully it starts easing. Unfortunately, we don't, uh, the markets react every time we think it might be easing. And then of course it goes the other way and markets react the other way. So it's definitely created some volatility. And the number one thing that's being volatile with it is of course the US dollar. And the US dollars, uh, obviously affected by all of this inflation talk because it's a safe haven and we've seen demand spill in from global uh, inflation recession fears the dollar has gone higher so we're actually sitting at 20-year highs back in september but it's come down from there since then <clears throat> but for us this outside market is pretty uh, worth worth paying attention to because obviously if the dollar's higher it's going to affect our commodity demand so <clears throat> and we've seen that already so I do have a few updates that I've done to my presentation since the printout in there. So obviously markets are always going. So um, I did have put the dollar index in and you can see just from the last year that we've had quite a, quite a ramp up in the dollar going up and then the, finally this fall we've seen a little bit decrease. Um, so we are technically on a downtrend in the dollar which is a good sign and actually where this chart ended up about that 102 area, it's about currently where we're trading. So we'll be watching it going forward, but it seems to have good support there right around that 100 uh, point mark. So we'll see what happens after that. If we were to fall there, we might be in good graces, but as of now, we're still higher than we were at this point last year. So definitely something to keep an eye on. The other part of this is obviously outside energy markets. Crude has been the big one. Um, we're currently trading between that 70 and $80, good support around 70. But again, had a lot to do um, with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, obviously this year, and a whole bunch of political headlines. I'm not gonna get into them because I'm sure you've heard the synopsis about everywhere else. Um, but of course, it 
picks into our inflation fears. And since we've peaked with inflation um, and it's starting to come down, there are still concerns about demand going forward. So we've seen a good downturn on crude prices. Uh, we've been recommending to guys to fill up on fuel here too if you can get anything below three dollars. Um, probably not a good bad point to start um, doing some fuel needs if you need to. But of course OPEC's in the mix of things too, cutting production and what they're going to do is what's the real story here? Are they trying to uh, just play with prices or are they really playing with the real fundamentals that are out there? No one really knows. But right now the big tensions continue with Russia and Ukraine. At the beginning of December we did see a price cap put on Russian oil, $60 um, a barrel uh, by the group of seven, the EU and Australia. So this means that they could still continue purchasing oil, the EU countries, um, it, even if it is above $60 a barrel, the, the problem comes in is the shipping companies. They were only allowed to ship oil and insurance companies to insure oil shipments that were bought $60 or under. Well, it worked out for Russia because their oil prices were $60 or under. So, um, and actually since then, if you can see on my little graph, that orange line at the bottom is Russian oil prices and they've steeply fallen since that ban was put in place. Well, Russia came back at the end of December over Christmas break and it told us that they're going to ban sending any oil to any of these price cap companies. So I don't think we're hearing the end of it. That'll start February 1st and go through July. Um, so that's pretty big. Fortunately, a lot of these countries, the EU, the Group of Seven, they've been looking at other sources and getting their oil elsewhere. Uh, but the main one that we need to be watching is China. China's been actually importing a lot of Russian oil and really, really cheap. So it'll be interesting to see going forward how that happens. And of course, Chinese demand has been another topic of its own. So I did put in crude oil prices too, but with China's demand in their economy um, looking like they're going to be a little bit better, uh, their COVID cases are still rising, but they're opening their country up. So there's a lot of back and forth that are affecting our markets too on what that's going to mean for not only oil demand, but also our commodities as well, corn and soybeans. So the Russia-Ukraine conflict, I mentioned that we're almost a year into this thing. That again started on February 24th. Um, we've seen a lot of this take effect on the wheat market, but other markets are worth noting too, especially on corn. Ukraine is usually the third or fourth largest uh, corn exporter in the world. Comes in line with depending on what Argentina does. Well, Argentina doesn't look too good this year. So looking at it, I'd say that there's even a good chance Ukraine could still end up third um, or fourth, even given the conflict this year. And Ukraine does export all majority of their corn to China. So again, another big influence there too with China's demand. Um, if they're not able to get that crop, they're going to be on the global market looking as well. But of course, wheat is the big one, um, but also oil seeds too. And we've seen soybeans actually get a lot of boost from this too because of the soy complex. Oil kind of ran with oils and everything else because of um, the conflict as well. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not just going to be affecting wheat going forward. I think it's going to affect all three of our grains um, if something were to happen. There hasn't been a whole lot of fresh news over the holiday other than the Russian oil ban, but of course they're keeping their export deal going. It looks like everybody's still exporting wheat and everything really good, and of course it's cheap. That's probably the biggest thing that U.S. wheat has to overcome is that we're just really high on the global market. We aren't very competitive. When it comes to quality wheat, obviously we kind of rule that roost, but um, other countries, African countries that are looking for cheap wheat, they're still able to source it from Russia or Ukraine. And Russia's sitting on what they think is a record crop this year and they're exporting it pretty well. So definitely worth watching in the world of all of our grains, not just wheat. The other one that we're seeing continue over into 2022 is obviously South America as the weather and we've been in a weather market here I'd probably say for the last month on corn and beans just based on what Argentina's forecasts do on a daily basis. They update at noon in case you didn't know that. So our last hour can be kind of interesting some days. But we've had a La Nina the past two years in South America. This year looks like the third year. Um, kind of abnormal. They haven't had a third year La Nina since 1950. So it's really hard to gauge what kind of effects it's going to have on the country and its crops. 
Um, but when we started looking at their 23 crops earlier this year, they were looking at records. So we're not necessarily seeing that trend line yield follow through at this time. It's kind of backed off, especially for Argentina. That's the dry one right now. Southern Brazil is dry, um, but not as dry as a lot of the bigger producing areas of Brazil. They're still doing pretty well. They started harvest in their northern areas, um, and they'll work their way south. So I think as we get more harvest results in, it'll be interesting to see what the trade takes that as. As of right now, a lot of talk about offsetting Brazil's record crop and their good producing areas will likely offset a lot of the losses in Argentina. Um, and that could probably be true. It just depends which crop you want to talk about. There's soybeans, there's corn, and there's wheat. So we have a few different crops that we have to get through to really see how it does offset. Unfortunately, until harvest is done, we might not know. And that's going to be till March. So we could be in a good weather market here for another couple of months just on South America's weather. And again, Argentina is the main focus. Um, also, obviously, for soybeans, not only are they the third world's largest, uh, third, world's third largest soybean exporter, they do are the top exporter for soy oil and soy meal as well. So those outside markets have really been the, the ones to watch on the soy complex. Um, meal got record long fund positions uh, just this last week. Oil's still holding on there and meal's near, near record high prices. So all because a lot of this is going down in South America. So we, it does leave some opportunities open to us. So I just put in a precip map of Argentina's Grain Belt region here too. But again, they're looking at their second driest year from 2008. Um, this does compare when El Nino did finally step in in 2009 and we saw a good amount of precipitation increase um, again through August through next fall. So it could be that we're still a ways away from really seeing El Nino turn around um, or come into play. Uh, South America's crop production, this is probably the big one that the USDA reports are going to be watching here this week. Um, looking at trade guesses, uh, they are down considerably from where we started for record numbers. Um, but we could see some bigger changes yet. Um, I think there are some good cuts that could be. These are some private analyst estimates um, that we found from South of, in South America of what they're seeing. So there's a good chance we could see even further cuts. We know USDA is a little bit slow when it comes to some bullish numbers. So to, expecting big cuts on this report, I don't see it really happening. But I think down the road, eventually, we'll see it uh, pop up a little bit more, especially once we know what their harvest and production numbers are looking like. Here in the U.S. for 2022, obviously we had quite a year. Um, we started out with looking at some record yields around the area. Uh, fortunately for our area, talking with a lot of guys, we, we did really well this last year for corn, soybeans, wheat. Um, we didn't really see a lot of the trouble, but we, I have a, we have a branch office in Iowa. Different story. So they definitely saw some yield legs. Now, it's hard to feel sorry for guys with 200 bushel corn year after year after year, but they did have a 20% bushel per or loss off of a lot of their APHs this year uh, for both corn and soybeans. So there were definitely some yield losses in some dry areas further south. So it, it definitely had an effect on how the USDA viewed it and they did go down from those higher yield estimates. Tomorrow's report looks like a snoozer. They're really not looking for a big cut or a big increase either way. And that kind of worries me a little bit. I think USDA could surprise in this area of the report on Thursday. We'll see what happens, but I think that the soybean yield could definitely be increased a little bit more, and so could corn for that matter. So, um, and it could be up to a bushel, uh, I would think, even a bushel and a half possibly when it's all said and done. So we'll see, but again, these are the final numbers for 2022, um, and then we won't hear about it again. So we could see a little bit more of an adjustment there. I'll skip over some of this. So what's next? We're going to start looking at the outlook here for what USD is currently looking at. Um, I kind of went over the U.S. stock numbers already, but there too we're looking for a little bit of an increase um, in Thursday's USD report. Again, mainly due to demand. Uh, that's going to be the main story there. Uh, our exports are obviously lackluster this year, um, and I think they likely are because everyone's kind of expecting this record crop from South America, or they have been, and they know it's cheaper there. So in the grand scheme of things, I have a feeling that affected some of our exports as well. But given the current situation, it wouldn't be surprising to see the USDA just um, pull back a little bit on our demand. 
Looking at global numbers, uh, corn's gonna be really affected by supplies going forward. Obviously, we've had uh, production issues here in the U.S. This, this year, but there's also talk we could see it again next year. We'll see what weather does, but there's other issues around the world too. Ukraine, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen there, and that could be a prolonged issue. South America's production is still up in the air. Um, like I said, U.S. production ending stocks are somewhat declining. It depends what they do with production. Depends what they do with exports on Thursday's USDA report. But we also know China needs the corn, and China hasn't been buying a ton of corn from us. But I just wanted to pull up this chart. This is world ending stocks, and currently we're at that 298 area, and that includes China. If we take out China's numbers, it sinks dramatically to 92. So I think we need to start looking at these numbers without China. Uh, China is only as good as the numbers they give us. <laughs> we really don't know what's all sitting there, and they're sitting on a lot of corn stocks, and if that's the case, they're not getting rid of them. Uh, China doesn't export corn, so they keep it for their own use. So I think we need to start looking at some of these numbers without it. It becomes a lot more concerning um, when that's the case. Uh, same thing for soybeans, although that market is going to be mainly driven by demand, of course, going forward. Again, China, we have this oil seed market that's seeing a boom, um, not only because of Ukraine, but we're also seeing the rush to crash kind of enter in as well in our oil seed markets. Um, and that's gotten some byproduct demand. So right now, looking at world soybean numbers, we're going to need some production to remain ideal, especially in the U.S. and Brazil. So you can see we're still not um, that, that high on the ending stocks number. And again, we take out China, we're looking at a significant number lower than that. Wheat side, again, is going to be uh, just kind of like uh, corn, really based on supplies going forward, uh, based on production. We know Russia and Ukraine have had issues. Russia's looking at a record crop. We need North America to have a good rebound. The winter wheat crop isn't looking that great. Um, we do get winter wheat seedings on Thursday's report, and they're looking at like a seven-year high number for uh, winter wheat seedings. It's kind of deceiving because a lot of that crop isn't in the best of condition as of right now. So, but that crop has about nine lives, kind of like a cat, and it still seems to come back just fine in the spring. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But um, there too, and same with the EU, they were they were dry this year. Australia is wet, on the other hand. Argentina is dry. India is dry. A lot of these bigger producers. So the world of wheat is not is not as great looking as you could think of corn and soybeans. Um, global usage, we're still up above uh, production here for the third year. Um, it'll be definitely worth, worth watching going forward. And I did pull in the same chart like I did for corn and soybeans, looking at ending stocks there too. Without China, it's a totally different picture. So 2023 drivers, I did put in a list of different black swans, and I kind of talked about each one of them here already going forward, but I do have a few that I want to touch on. And of course is this La Nina pattern that's continuing. So I put triple play La Nina, and you can definitely tell I'm from a casino town. <laughs> but um, this is the first in about 70 years, like I said, it's from the 1950s, we haven't seen that. And it is still showing up. Um, they're talking that it may ease come March, but for a lot of places, especially South America, it's going to be too late by March. So uh, we'll keep an eye on extended forecasts. They're always subject to change, though. And as of right now, even looking at extended forecasts, even here in the U.S., we've seen abnormally warm temperatures this winter. And it looks like that's going to be continuing in the long-term forecast. One month and, and three-month forecasts still look abnormally dry. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how we come out of spring. That's really the key. If you listen to any weatherman, they tell you that. The snow doesn't really matter. We'll see what happens in the spring. But again, if that if that continues on and we see another season like this, we could definitely see the same things happen in some of these big production areas again. Definitely support prices where they're at today. But the stars need to align and this needs to happen. Otherwise, I'd say we're too high where we're at today for this to continue on its own. Um, another one that I'm going to start looking at here too, um, making recommendations going forward, are these corn and soybean ratios. Um, right now we are favoring corn to beans, we're favoring corn to wheat, and wheat to beans is actually pretty equal right now. But these are the ratios using new crop prices for these crops. 
um, and how I kind of see what the market's currently favoring based on price. So looking at these numbers today and how they're sitting, I'd say soybeans and wheat need to buy acres. I think that's pretty true if you look at spring wheat prices right now. I've talked to a lot of guys even up by the Canadian border who are really thinking about doing a different rotation this year and not planting spring wheat. Can make a lot of money doing other things, including canola um, or some of those other s smaller grains that they can do up there. So I think there's some room here. The unfortunate part is that to correct these ratios, obviously we'd love to see uh, uh, wheat rally and we'd like to see soybeans rally to get these ratios a bit better but in all reality we could see prices go down to make those ratios look better too so we need to be aware of that I, I like to say I'm bullish going into February but we could also see the market go down and correct these ratios as well so just an important note to to look at there but we are in that time frame when the market's going to start looking at buying acres going into next year. Crop insurance month is just around the corner here in February. Um, so I did talk a little bit about this too, this rush to crash with vegetable oils. Um, we're seeing some plants coming into our area and our region here, but there's looking at a lot more too. U.S. soybean crush, they're expecting it to increase 10%. Even can Canada's canola crush, they're looking at an increase of 60% um, in the next few years. So now what? What does that do to our, to, um, our crops? Well, we could see exports drop. Ultimately, it's going to create more competition at the local level for our elevators versus some of these plants as well. So I think this is going to affect both soybeans and canola, especially since um, we can kind of see canola come through a little bit. Uh, but Canada is increasing their production up there too. Um, we're also going to have a need for meal exports. Right now we're not huge meal exporters, but if we're increasing crush this much, it has to go somewhere. So we could become more competitive with Argentina and Brazil. The question is, how is it going to get there? It's going to be the same thing. We're going to have, if it's on an export market, it's probably going to have to go west. So we'll have to look at that. If none of those things um, really correct itself, the only other thing we're going to have to do is find more acres. And where are we going to find more acres? It's going to have to come from somewhere else. Um, unfortunately, we don't get just more land, so it has to come from somewhere. So it'll be interesting to see how this develops. I think we could start seeing this play out in some of the marketplaces here this next year, since some of these plants are looking at coming online in 2024. So it could be an interesting year to be watching prices. Maybe, I mean, we've had phenomenal basis this year and it's still relatively good I mean in all reality compared to a few years ago um, we could see that just being maintained because of some of these crush plants coming online too so another factor to be watching um, we might be in a new realm of basis for our area so um, and then I did pull in this too here you can see the jump in soybean acres that would really be needed over the next few years if all these plants do come online um, right now they're still in the process of being built and this and that. So there is a possibility some of them may not happen, but looking at it as of right now, we're going to need a lot more um, soybean acres coming in. So what you're doing definitely has demand going forward. So obviously we have a lot of drivers. So now getting into my analysis and recommendations, these are as of Friday's. Monday's closes actually. Um, March corn um, has really been in a really solid trading range since this fall. Um, we're kind of in the middle of that range right now. Honestly, with looking at the way prices are even today, we're really hoping we hold that 650 area on March corn. If we were to break that, I think we could hit that December low of 635 pretty easily. So just be on the lookout for that. If we broke 735, it would not be good. So those are the numbers we're definitely watching. Again, we have some targets to the upside. That 680 mark has definitely been a top of resistance, but above that, it's really $7 or even to 720. So anywhere in there, uh, we'd recommend probably adding to some sales. We did have an order in at 680 um, right at the end of December, and it just got shy of hitting. We were pretty disappointed about that, but that's still our target um, for, for corn. But looking at the charts too, I also watched these stochastics if you've ever seen me or listened to me before. But last week we were up here, this week we're down here. So I would look for a turn higher coming um, relatively soon since we've turned. Looking at December 23 corn, there too we're kind of hitting support around 590. Let's hope that holds. Um, if not, we could definitely see this thing fall apart pretty quick. But on the upside, we're still seeing resistance around 620, so I would recommend putting some orders in around there. If you haven't done any yet, I'd start around $6 um, to, for pricing 23 uh, corn. 
Looking at March beans, there too we're kind of in the middle of our range. I'm just surprised the amount of support we've had up here near 15 bucks. It's absolutely crazy to me um, when we're talking about this. It just makes me think that maybe a lot of these bullish numbers are already priced in with South America. So any turn like that could definitely turn things around. Um, but it's good. We're seeing the funds come in here as well. They've been adding to their long positions. So maybe there's hope yet. Uh, but yeah, we've seen it just in December alone, the soybean market rallied over a dollar. And since harvest, we've rallied almost two dollars so um, we've had a really good rewarding market if you have beans left I don't know what you're doing <laughs> obviously you're gambling a little bit and that's okay but um, we're still getting really good cash prices too so I'd recommend taking advantage of it because it could definitely turn the other way as well um, looking at November beans there too we've had really good resistance around $14 so I'd recommend starting there if you needed to um, looking at next year's crop uh, but yeah, as of right now, we're just kind of hanging out in a solid trading range. Wheat doesn't look very pretty. Um, this is the one I'm probably the most worried about even given today's action. We're at the bottom of our range looking at March futures at $9. If we were to break that 880 mark, we could definitely go to 850. Doesn't look very pretty, but hopefully we find some support here. Even looking at technicals here, um, we could definitely see a turn coming on spring wheat. So if it helps at all, I've actually been buying spring wheat. <laughs> I hope that, I hope I'm right. Um, but it's, I think it's a good time to start adding at it, just looking at charts. Looking at next year too, kind of at the bottom of our range there, um, I'd maybe start adding at $9 if you haven't done any. But honestly, looking at all three grains and probably the most bullish wheat going forward, I know that maybe sounds a little bit weird, but I think given how it's priced compared to the other two, I think it does have room to go and I think it has to go up to get there. Um, just given input costs and everything else uh, for wheat and also world stocks are, we're looking at 15 year lowest here um, at this next report. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. So I'm probably the most optimistic on the wheat side uh, going forward. I also put in our current recommendations um, where we're currently at with the Money Farm where we do market consulting um, for guys. We also do it uh, individually too through a marketing program. But overall, this is our overall recommendations that we put out. Um, for 2022, we did put in some good to order cancel orders on 2022 and 23 corn that haven't hit yet, but we have started to slowly add into 23 crop. Um, we are sitting on a little bit of soybeans too, so I guess I can't give you too much gruff, but uh, looking at where prices are today, we probably should just dump the rest of it. Um, but that's where we're sitting. Of course, um, if you have questions or anything like that, feel free to give me Give me some crap. I'm always happy to listen to opposing views and opinions. <laughs> I'll just probably give it back to you.